All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Christine Christman. I'm the executive director of the Watershed Center Grand Traverse Bay. And on behalf of the Watershed Center, Tip of the Mitt Watershed Council, and the entire Elk River Chain of Lakes Watershed Plan Implementation Team, uh, we wanna welcome you and thank you for participating in this local government event. The Elk River Chain of Lakes Watershed Plan Implementation Team, or Urkel Whip It, as we affectionately call it, uh, was formed over a decade ago to implement activities pertaining to the Elk River Chain of Lakes in the Grand Traverse Bay Watershed Protection Plan. Organized by the Watershed Center and Tip of the Mitt, Urkel Whippet engages lake associations, local governments, area nonprofits, and interested citizens in collaborative efforts to protect and preserve water quality throughout the entire watershed. Just to frame the watershed for everybody, the Elk River Chain of Lakes is the largest subwatershed in the Grand Traverse Bay watershed. It covers 500 square miles of land, has over 60 square miles of open water, and 200 miles of shoreline. So the lakes and streams that are found in this watershed are some of the most pristine inland water bodies in the entire county and provide many recreational and economic benefits for full-time uh, residents and tourists. The area is home to over 45,000 citizens that live in portions of five counties, 25 townships, and six municipalities. So to protect water quality and to continue to provide a high quality of life, it's essential for local governments to understand watershed why threats and opportunities and work with their neighboring communities in efforts of shared values. So every few years, Urkel Whippet likes to bring elected and appointed officials from out throughout the entire chain of lakes together to share our successes, engage with and learn from representatives of our local governments and discuss issues or ideas to focus on over the next few years. Today, we're gonna to be talking about results from a social indicator survey conducted by Tip of the Mitt, uh, Tip of the Mitt Watershed Council. Uh, we're gonna provide an update on the Elk River Chain of Lakes Watershed Management Plan and share a collaborative action plan for high urgency, high impact ideas for the next few years. So during the presentations, if you have any questions, please put those in the Q&A. You're not able to use the chat. So if you have questions, make sure you use that, the Q&A in order to get your questions in. And then after the presentation, we'll go through and we'll answer those questions for you. Because this is a webinar, all of the participants are muted. So the uh, chance that you have to interact with us is to, to put your um, thoughts and your questions into that Q&A. So to kick us off, I wanna introduce uh, Granetta Tomasi, Watershed Policy Director at Tip of the Mitt Watershed Council. Thanks, Christine. First thing I'm gonna do is share my screen and show you, can you see it, Christine? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. So um, I just wanted to show you the um, watershed, I mean, the Tip of the Mitt Watershed Council homepage here. It's at watershedcouncil.org because if you go to our waters right here and then down to watersheds, click that, and then find Elk River Chain of Lakes Watershed here and click that. And then you'll see right away here, a committee page. And if you click that, that shows you a section here Elk River Chain of Lakes survey results and fact sheets. So these reports are all, I'm not gonna go through all three of these reports, but these dig deep into each separate survey. So here's the watershed residents, shoreline property owners, local officials, and then a fact sheet about all three. So I just thought that that would be um, something that you would wanna know. Is, is there in case you're interested after this. So um, now I'm going to show do my PowerPoint here. And are we good, Christine? Sorry, I was muted. Yes, you're good. Yeah, I figured you might be. That's why I waited. Okay, thank you so much. All right, so here we have um, the Elk River Chain of Lakes Watershed Plan Social Indicator Baseline Surveys. So in the past few years, 
Tip of the Mint Watershed Council did a series of mail surveys to create a baseline in the Elk River Chain of Lakes watershed for future comparison and to gather information to help us with the writing of our new watershed ma management plan and our uh, educational strategies for implementing that new plan. So for those of you, you who are not familiar with us, the Watershed Council was formed in 1979. We currently have over 2,700 members. And the, the picture here is our service area, which is essentially four counties, Sheboygan, Emmett, Charlevoix, and Antrim. But they're built around the watersheds of the Sheboygan River watershed, Little Traverse Bay watershed, Lake Charlevoix watershed, and then of course the Chain of Lakes. But that's so that's roughly four counties, but we do work in the counties where the watersheds uh, bleed into past the uh, jurisdictional boundaries. And this, these surveys that I'm going to tell you about were done in partnership and also funded by Eagle the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, and the US Environmental Protection Agency or EPA. So what are social indicator studies? These are formal processes that attempt to measure behavioral changes. They can be done in surveys, in person, on the phone, by paper or mail or online. They can also be done in focus groups or in individual qualitative interviews with targeted audiences. So these studies are specifically done to better understand what our members and the general public know about how to protect water and also what concerns they have. So the point of this is to use what we find out to be more effective as we educate area residents and local governments and assist them in water protection efforts. So first we're gonna talk about SIDMA, which stands for Social Indicators Data Management and Analysis, and that's an EPA tool. And um, this SIDMA uh, gives uh, survey information that uh, for rural watersheds, like, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm sorry, this got, hidden from me. This first bullet point was hidden from me, so I apologize. But basically, um, the point of it is that rural watersheds normally don't have this kind of information that we're collecting. Uh, and the surveys are conducted using this agency, the, the EPA system called SIDMA. And our 2010 survey series for Lake Char Charlevoix, that was a baseline that we did when we did that, it was the first time that this system ever used a pristine watershed rather than a uh, impaired watershed that has uh, total maximum daily loads that they have to pay attention to and all that type of thing. SIDMA had been used many times in um, impaired watersheds, but never until we did the Charlevoix survey in 2010, it hadn't been done in a pristine watershed. So social, uh, um, social indicator studies measure changes in behavior and target audiences. And our surveys picked three particular things that we focused on. The first was attitudes, which are related to willingness to adopt or change a practice. We focused also on awareness and we just basically wanted to measure what our, our audiences know about watershed protection. And then we also focused on asking about limitations or constraints that they felt they had to adopting or changing practices. And then of course, uh, behaviors are actual practices by individuals or communities. So for the goal here, um, we wanna learn uh, information, learn from landowners and local officials we wanted to create a baseline for the watershed to use when collecting data in the future. Um, so, and I go back to those Charlevoix surveys that we did in 2010. In 2020, we followed up those same surveys 10 years later asking the same questions and we were able to measure a difference between the baseline that we collected in 2010. 
Uh, another goal here is to use these indicators to increase educational program uh, programs uh, when we implement watershed management plan steps. And finally, a goal is to contribute to the development of a regionally coordinated social indicator survey system, which is SIDMA. So they learned from things when we did our work in these uh, unimpaired watersheds. So we conducted three mail surveys in, uh, yeah, mail surveys in the Elk River Chain of Lakes from 2017 to 2019, <coughs> excuse me, and we surveyed local officials, shoreline property owners, and watershed residents generally. For both surveys, our methodology used something called a five-wave design. In this method, a pre-survey letter is mailed first, and then a week later, the survey with a cover letter and self-addressed stamped envelope is sent. A reminder postcard is mailed two weeks after the first survey mailing to anyone who hasn't responded. And then the second survey goes out with a cover letter and self-addressed envelope uh, to any non-respondents around two weeks after the reminder postcard. And then a final reminder letter is sent to the landowners who have not responded two weeks after we sent them the second survey. And so that they are not sent duplicate surveys, we put a tracking number in the corner of every survey. And when the survey was returned, the number would be cut off and separated to ensure that the tracking number and survey answers could be entered without being able to associate any answers to a particular respondent. So we did the watershed residence survey uh, from October to December of 2017. Of the three, this was the lowest return. We were targeting about 30%, so and we got a low return rate here of 25%. Of those who responded, 66% were male, 34% female. They ranged in the age of mid 50s to mid 70s. And the majority, again, this was the watershed residents as a whole, the majority who answered lived in rural non-farm residents, and the second most answers came from people living in a town, village, or city. Shoreline property owners, we did the survey November uh, 2017 to March 2018. We had a very good return rate here. This beat our expected uh, targeted average uh, 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 at 40%, so we were really happy to hear from the shoreline property owners. Similar male-female mix, same age range. 44% were people who lived here as a primary residence on shorelines, and 56% said that they used this home as a secondary residence. And then we surveyed local officials from March to June of 2018. We got a 30% 30, 30 return, which was right on our target. Um, we had 57% male, 43%, so for a little bit higher female than in the other two. Um, same age range, late 50s. Well, this was late 50s to early 70s. 53% of the local officials who answered this survey were elected and 34% were planning commissioners, and 13% served on zoning boards of appeal. And the majority of respondents were township officials at 54%, and then 32% from villages and 14% from the county. So, when we did the survey, all three groups had similar answers to some of these key questions. They all three groups believe the quality of our water is good. There are few watershed impairments. Economic stability depends on good water quality in this area. It's not okay to reduce water quality to promote economic development. And that the quality of life in their community really depends on good quality water quality in our lakes, rivers, and streams. So let's look at some of the attitudes that we looked at. So watershed residents, shoreline property owners, and local officials all had very positive attitudes about the value of water quality in the Elk River watershed. The underlying assumption should be that audiences in the Urkel watershed already value good water, water quality because they do. Um, they told us this. 
And you should emphasize that when you're presenting new proposals or projects or any kind of outreach and education information, you, 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 you should remember that you're talking to an audience who values good water quality. And the most important activities to all the categories uh, were scenic beauty, boating, swimming, and then picnicking or other family activities near the water. Economic stability depends on good water quality, as I mentioned earlier. And again, the underlying assumption should be that quality of life and economic stability depends on good water quality because local officials and residents really agree with that according to our survey. 83% of watershed residents and 92% of local officials either agreed or strongly agreed that it's important to protect water quality even if it slows economic development. And the key word there is slow, not stop. Nobody's saying we should stop economic development, but if it takes a few extra meetings uh, to debate a, a, a proposal or a development or a procedure, you know, if it takes a few more meetings to do that, um, then we take the time to do it so that we can do it right. At least that's what the survey respondents told us. Local officials disagree that taking action is action to protect water quality is too expensive. They were even willing to consider increases in local taxes or fees to improve water quality. And actually residents were slightly, slightly more willing to pay taxes or fee than the local officials were willing to impose those. Over 80% of the Elk River watershed residents agree that they have a personal responsibility to protect water quality, which is great. They strongly agree that how they care for their lawn and yard can affect water quality, and they support and are willing to change personal land management practices to improve water quality. So now let's look at awareness. A majority of watershed residents said their stormwater runoff goes into nearby lakes, rivers, or other waterbeds. In addition, some respondents answered that it went into soil and, and nearby aquifers. So there's uh, a lot of awareness in the watershed about rainwater and water generally. All three groups felt believed that invasive aquatic plants and animals are the biggest problem in the watershed. So the uh, Urkel Whippet committee members really should continue all the ed educational efforts in this regard because you're really fostering an increased awareness of uh, invasive species issue. When it came to water impairments, most survey respondents perceived few impairments, but a high percentage in all three categories did not know if a specific pollutant or condition was a problem or not. So education programs really should focus on a specific pollutant or source risk, especially phosphorus. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, it was notable that over 50% of local officials didn't know if toxic materials in the water is a local problem or not. Over 50%, that's pretty high. And again, this survey was done with local officials from March to June of 2018. And at that time, Flint was in the news because the state was cutting off payments for bottled water. And the early news of discovery of PFAS in some Michigan locations was highly publicized also as a threat to water supplies. So we can't prove that these things influence this answer, but they could have. And then in terms of consequences of poor water quality, in spite of expressing confidence earlier in the survey that water, recall, water quality remains good, some responses do reflect a growing concern about water quality issues. So any education and projects directed at improving habitat, managing aquatic plants, in addition to stormwater runoff, those three topics, would likely resonate with local officials, shoreline property owners, and watershed residents in terms of the consequences of poor water quality and what you can do to battle that.
And finally, we'll take a look at constraints. So in terms of riparian buffer maintenance, also known as green belts, both watershed residents and shoreline property owners said, as I noted earlier, they're willing to make changes to lawn and garden practices, and they really don't see many limitations for them to do so. 56% of the shoreline property owners we surveyed said they currently use a vegetated buffer zone, riparian buffer zone, green belt, whatever you want to call it. Only 5% said they're unwilling to try it, meaning broad outreach and ed education efforts really should have a good chance of succeeding. And any limitations noted to us were often related to a need for specific information or, you know, how do I do that? Or can you demonstrate the practice? So education programs targeting homeowners really ought to concentrate on those kinds of things, information, skills, and demonstrations of specific practices. And then in terms of planning and zoning, um, it was interesting because I had done the Charlevoix series, you know, 10 years apart, uh, this was pretty interesting to me. Local officials indicated that some issues limited their community's ability to change planning and zoning to protect water quality a lot or some. And so the biggest constraints were resistance to new regulations, concerns about economic impact of new regulations, and also just securing approval from community residents. So those are very understandable uh, concerns. So additional public engagement throughout the process may help you reduce some of those barriers. The, the survey showed that fact sheets posted on your websites or attractive websites that focus on an issue they are used by residents when they're looking for information. So the survey results also show that if you held additional meetings for your controversial proposals, or if you did meetings in a workshop type of setting or a town hall, that could help you improve support for new proposals that are, are, are controversial. And only 24% of local officials reported that they know how to coordinate their zoning provisions with neighboring communities, and only 27% indicated that they use this practice. Um, this is a point that we encourage local governments to explore, especially when you have something like a torch lake. Um, again, let me refer back to Charlevoix. On Lake Charlevoix, as you know, big lake lots of different townships surrounding that lake. I wanna say eight, maybe 10, I forget off the top of my head. But we've worked with each of those townships on this point. Uh, we teamed up with MSU Extension and Leah, and um, we held regular zoning administrator meetings um, for townships around Lake Charlevoix. Because the point is that if you have a township that's passing things that are protective of water quality, and the townships around the rest of the lake aren't doing anything similar that will dilute the effectiveness, obviously. So if there could be some coordinated efforts, uh, you might be able to protect lakes better. And when we uh, surveyed this and after we sort of concentrated on this for 10 years with the Lake Charlevoix folks, when we resurveyed, there was a dramatic jump in the response in the survey and they were reporting that they knew how to do this and they are doing it regularly and we see that too so and then finally septic systems for watershed residents 58 percent said that they have their septic systems pumped every three to five years and 77 percent either already do this or they're willing to do it um, watershed residents really saw no need for oversight by either health department or local governments. And when they were asked if a local government agency should handle inspection and maintenance of septic systems, a whopping 58% said no, 19% said yes, and 23% did not know. By contrast, shoreline property owners were much more open to oversight by the health department or local governments. 66% said 
said they would like a reminder to inspect and maintain septic systems. 33% said no, and 1% did not know. That's quite, quite dramatic between shoreline property owners and watershed residents as a whole. And um, we chalked that up to education efforts being directed more toward uh, watershed res, I mean, um, shoreline property owners and, and uh, that type of thing. Now the local officials were opposed to health department oversight. Only 11% said yes, 73% said no, and 16% did not know. They were more open to local government oversight saying 34% yes, but still 44% no and 22% didn't know. But you know, 34% being willing as opposed to 11% <laughs> is, a, is a jump. So we plan to continue our efforts on septic system education because uh, those answers were interesting and we definitely are listening to them, but we're also going to use those answers to target certain audiences that we think might benefit from just because nothing has happened to your septic system that you can see doesn't necessarily mean everything's okay. <laughs> so anyway, I'm gonna stop there. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Granada. There are four questions right now. Uh, if there are folks that have other questions, please feel free to throw that in the Q&A. Um, our first question is asking about the financial scope of the social indicator baseline surveys. Financial scope, how much did it cost? That's my assumption. And if that's not right, let us know, but that's my assumption. About. I'm gonna say about 30,000 because we had to um, buy all the materials, of course. Uh, there was staff time to actually create the surveys and do the analysis. And then I also hired a graduate student um, to enter the uh, information as the surveys came in into the SIDMA system. And then we uh, had to um, work within the SIDMA system to get the results and put them in graphs and that type of thing. So I'm, I'm gonna say 25, 30,000 roughly with all that staff time and materials and that type of thing. The next question is asking about the survey in particular, what the budget was for dis distri distributing the survey. So mailing all of the surveys out. And the That's included in that, in that amount. And that's where I got my figure from the grant that I had that, that put this together. So there were other things involved in that grant, but my piece was about 25, 30,000 roughly of okay. that larger grant. Uh, the next question is, so I'll read it how it's stated so that this makes sense to you, Gren. It would be of interest to know the percentage response of the subsets. For example, 14% of township respondents may have been from zoning boards, but what proportion of the zoning board officials responded? I would encourage you to look at my reports that are posted online and you can, I didn't quite get the question there, but I think from the gist of it, I think you're going to find what you're looking for on my reports that are posted online. Okay, that's a great reminder, I think, to folks that there's a lot more information on the on your website that you posted out or that you showed everybody at the beginning. Yeah. Um, and the last question is uh, if the copy of the presentation is available and you had mentioned this is being recorded and will be posted, so. Yes, yes, we will put this event online and, and we'll send out uh, uh, an email to those that were invited, you know, so that they can, you know, both to people who attended as well as those who couldn't, so that obviously the ones who couldn't could see it. Great, that's all we have. And if anything else comes up, we'll pull you back at the end, but thank you very much. Yes, thank you. It was great to be here, thank you. We'll move on to uh, Jennifer Buchanan, who is the Associate Director at Tip of the Mitt Watershed Council to talk about the uh, Elk River Channel Lakes Watershed Management Plan. Good and uh, let's see, it is afternoon, I think. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, can everybody hear me? Granada, can you nod yep. if you can hear me? Yep, 
Yeah. Okay, great. <clears throat> Uh, thanks, Granetta, and thanks, Christine. Uh, my name is Jennifer Buchanan, Associate Director with Tip of the Met Watershed Council. I'm going to give you um, kind of an overview today of the Elk River Chain of Lakes Watershed Management Plan. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the plan itself, the watershed management planning process, and ultimately the plan implementation steps. So the Elk River Chain of Flakes watershed, and you've seen this map, um, consists of uh, 60 square miles of water, uh, which includes uh, over 200 miles of shoreline and 14, it's a series of 14 interconnected lakes and rivers, including over 200 streams and 138 miles of which are designated blue ribbon trout streams. So that's pretty exceptional. Uh, the watershed begins, uh, the headwaters begin near East Jordan and flows about 55 miles through the chain, dropping about 40 feet in elevation as it travels out to the Elk River. And that water then empties into Grand Traverse Bay, which contributes approximately 60% of the bay's tributary flow inputs. So all the areas shown in green is the Elk River Chain of Lakes watershed. Also noted, uh, worth noting, the maximum depth uh, of Torch Lake is 302 feet, uh, which is by far the deepest of all the lakes, followed by Elk Lake with a maximum depth of 195 feet. Within the Elk, River Chain of Lakes watershed, there are seven sub watersheds. So this slide you can see in the map shows those sub watersheds, also shows the corresponding townships. And the table on the right shows the breakdown between the counties that the watershed includes and the corresponding townships and municipalities. So five counties, Antrim, Grand Traverse, Charlevoix, Kalkaska, and Otsego counties. Previously, efforts to protect water quality within the Elk River Chain of Lakes watershed were addressed through the Grand Traverse Bay Protection Plan of 2005, uh, created by our friends at the Watershed Center, Grand Traverse Bay. This plan was approved by both the state of Michigan's Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, as well as the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, but then through an opportunity to partner with a team of graduate students at the University of Michigan School of Natural Resources and Environment and other watershed partners. An effort to create a standalone watershed management plan began in 2015 and has led to the current Elk River Chain of Lakes watershed management plan. The Urkel Watershed Management Plan has nine chapters, each component building upon the last. The plan begins by describing the watershed and outlining factors which contribute to water quality or potential impairment. Then the plan explores in depth the problem areas, sets goals and objectives to improve or maintain resources, and offers a strategy to evaluate the effectiveness over the 10 year duration of the plan. Chapter seven, implementation strategies might be the most important for members of this audience because it contains strategic steps for implementing both protection and restoration measures, including potential ordinance updates among many other critical steps. I just wanted to kind of give an overview of what is included in the watershed management planning process, if you're not familiar already. So it's basically a linear process of steps, as you can see by the diagram, it begins with identifying a geographic scope or watershed boundary uh, that you hope to address. And it includes bringing together stakeholders that work or have an interest within the watershed followed by an intensive inventory of resources that may be contributing to non-point source pollution, which if you're not familiar, is pollution that comes from 
diffuse sources across the landscape as compared to point source pollution that originates from a discrete source, like a pipe directly discharging polluted water into a nearby lake or stream. Once data is collected and compiled, the stakeholders determine which stressors within the watershed are impacting water resources, and then work to identify areas within the watershed to focus their attention and efforts for both water quality protection and restoration of resources. Corresponding goals and objectives are developed, perhaps most importantly, a comprehensive list of implementation steps are identified. I'll share more about those in a little bit. So the stakeholders, who all was involved in the watershed management planning process? Uh, the uh, logos shown are, is, uh, captures most, but certainly not all, who had a seat at the table to develop the watershed management plan and weigh in. Um, a stakeholder uh, typically consists of somebody that represented on the list on the left-hand side, but it's usually a group or individual who has the responsibility for implementing um, a decision toward watershed management protection and um, has the capacity to implement protection or restoration strategies. So thank you, of course, to all the stakeholders who continue to participate in protecting the Urkel watershed. As part of the watershed management planning process, uh, one of the things that uh, the early phases of that process include characterizing the watershed. So that can include um, gathering data about the natural resources, demographics, populations, um, uh, water resources uses, recreation, and so forth. So um, we include historic data as well as uh, current data that's collected through on the ground inventories. And I'll show you a series of maps here. This one, I just highlighted a few from the watershed management plan. There are many more. Here's one that um, identifies the soils within the Elk River Chain of Lakes watershed. Here's a map that uh, depicts groundwater recharge within the watershed. And then general land cover within the Elk, Rivers, Elk River Chain of Lakes. So all of these maps can be found within the plan. Stakeholders also gather data um, from both water quality databases um, and in the field monitoring to determine the degree of water quality for all surface waters within the watershed. In this case, uh, the plan includes data collected from a variety of sources, um, not limited to, but uh, including the EPA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, the uh, U.S. Geological Survey, Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, Tip of the Mint Watershed Council, the Health Departments, and many more. Some of the parameters that have been um, included within the Watershed Management Plan are listed here, and they include physical and chemical parameters of water, also looking at the biological communities of lakes and streams, and the bacteriological data collected specifically addressing E. coli. So water quality standards, um, this table is also included in the watershed management plan. It captures basically the water quality parameters that are necessary to meet designated water uses of the state, uh, of, uh, water uses of uh, surface waters within the state. And this is important for a number of reasons because um, they help determine if there's an impairment potentially to uh, designated use, including things like recreation, fisheries, public health and safety. So the data is included in the plan. Um, again, I will encourage you as we make the plan available to refer to this table 
and also compare it to the water quality um, data collected throughout the watershed. So again, as I mentioned, uh, part of that kind of data collection and resource inventories um, between uh, the different agencies, the Watershed Council, the Watershed Center, and uh, the graduate team at the U University of Michigan School of Natural Resources Environment, an exhaustive um, um, inventory was done for a number of things. So this is just kind of a collection of photos depicting some of the work. So uh, looking at road stream crossings, which can be uh, contribute to sediment and also impair um, hydrolo hydrologic connectivity and fish passage, uh, looking at storm water that may be um, discharged from a developed area into a surface water and then stream bank erosion as well. And then some of the um, things that were identified through this inventory process. Um, and most watersheds share similar, particularly in Northern Michigan, share a lot of the same stressors. So the Elk River Chain of Lakes watershed is not unique. We, we, we are faced with similar uh, challenges in Northern Michigan. So things like from agriculture, um, impacts can be generated from activities such as poorly located or managed um, livestock areas, uh, overgrazing, management of fields, things like what we call hydro modification activities, which include um, dams, stream channelization, and again, the road stream crossings that can impair water quality as well as habitat and stream bank erosion. And then in the more developed areas, which uh, the Elk River Chain of Lakes watershed does have some uh, urbanized areas, uh, we take a look at storm water. So water that runs off uh, impervious surfaces and directly discharges into nearby surface water without any sort of treatment. So that um, the pollutants can vary. <clears throat> um, and uh, basically in urban and suburban areas, much of the land that is already covered with buildings, pavement and compacted landscapes can, can contribute a degree of of effluent that's discharged directly. This is uh, not in the Ur uh, Elk River Chain of Lakes watershed, but um, another Northern Michigan community. So stormwater being discharged into a nearby surface water. So those are some of the things that we looked at um, and also then looked at the uh, uh, contaminants contained in some of that runoff, including sediments, oils, grease, toxic chemicals, pesticides and so forth. So as we went through the process of inventorying and collecting data, we generate basically a list, um, a geographic area that identifies uh, within the watershed what we consider critical areas. Critical areas are basically the sources of where some of this non-point source pollution is contributing the most to what potential water quality impairments. This map is also in the watershed management plan. So you can see we've highlighted some of the areas that need particular attention and how they correspond to some of these sources of potential uh, inputs from pollution. So whether it's a point um, on the map from dam or a dam or a severe road stream crossing, boat launch, or um, potentially even an aquatic invasive species. And then more broadly, some of the things like um, some of the municipalities or shoreline impaired areas, uh, stream bank erosion. So these are the focus areas that we would want to draw attention to moving forward. To, provide hopefully some corrective actions. 
again, a few more maps from the, the plan. Um, and so just kind of zooming in a little bit on some of these things that we've identified. So for road stream crossings, uh, you can see the map there. Uh, fish passage impacts as they're rated between severe, moderate, and um, low as far as potential impacts. Stream bank erosion, you can see where there is a corresponding um, degree of sediment loading, again, that would be impairing surface water quality. And then a slightly different view of that sediment loads from again, some of these road stream crossings and stream bank erosion, excuse me. And then for each community within the watershed, we looked at um, kind of the built up areas and looked where stormwater uh, was potentially contributing um, the most inputs to uh, pollutant inputs to nearby surface waters and also identified within those developed areas where green stormwater infrastructure could be implemented to help counter some of that, those inputs. Again, there are maps within the watershed management plan for each community. I've just highlighted two here for Bel Air and Elk, Elk Rapids. And then kind of on the flip side, so the critical areas looks, takes a look at areas that need more corrective or restoration actions. Um, but we also look at areas that are not impaired, but need protection. And so through what we call a priority parcel analysis, each parcel within the watershed uh, we uh, evaluated through uh, geographic information systems to determine its value in protecting water resources. So this, uh, this figure depicts the priority parcel analysis for the watershed, and once again, highlighting significant areas for conservation with regard to watershed protection. And a range of factors do go into this including parcel size, groundwater recharge potential, uh, wetlands, wetland quality, uh, lake and stream riparian ecosystems, steep slopes, protected land adjacency, threatened and endangered species, proximity to development, natural land cover types, drinking water protection areas, and other exceptional resources. Uh, the process that we used is described within the watershed management plan. So I encourage you to take a look at that. The watershed management plan also includes um, a list of goals and objectives developed um, for the watershed uh, and the stakeholders all contribute to development of these goals. There is no set number of goals necessary, um, but these goals were developed for this particular watershed and also um, a series of objectives um, that correspond to each goal. They are included in the plan, but you, you can read this and see the overall um, emphasis of um, what the plan is, is driving at looking to protect and the actions necessary. Implementation strategies. So this is kind of the, as I, I mentioned earlier, um, the perhaps the most important part of any watershed management plan. It includes a combination of measures that have been identified again through, with the assistance of stakeholders. Um, and they are wide ranging, um, everything from local zoning improvements, um, land protection targets, road stream crossing improvements um, and installation of just overall best management practices to either restore or protect water resources within the watershed. This is a requirement of the uh, uh, any approved watershed management plan and should include both a um, combination of both protection and restoration measures. 
for the Elk River Chain of Lakes watershed, um, they are broken down uh, these, these steps into these categories. Um, and there is a long list of them, which um, I will highlight in the next slide. Um, but again, within the plan itself, you can see the comprehensive lift, list of all of these protection or all of these implementation steps. Um, and again, they are categorized according to the um, categories you can see on the screen. As part of that, you have to identify who within the watershed may be most responsible in leading that measure, um, where, uh, when do you anticipate implementing that step, why and how much, how much money or how, much, how many resources are needed to complete that particular implementation task. So I've just highlighted a couple of slides or a couple of um, uh, screenshots basically from the watershed protection plan. Um, and so, as I mentioned, they were organized by category. So here's planning and zoning. And so, as I mentioned, there are a number of things that have to be highlighted, including cost, um, when this particular step would be implemented, who might be involved in that implementation and what goals are you looking to meet within the plan? So here under planning and zoning, you can see they correspond to um, things like the gaps analysis and ordinance work. Um, so all of these have been um, looked at from uh, the collection of stakeholders and have been um, decided to be uh, worthwhile pursuing over the course of the watershed management plan implementation, which again is about 10 years. So here's planning and zoning. Uh, and a couple just key steps from our water quality monitoring category. So the things that we feel are necessary to continue to do or to expand upon at any time within the next 10 years to protect water quality or restore water quality. So again, all included in the watershed management plan. So as you can see, these all have associated costs. Cost though is calculated in watershed management planning based on resources that isn't always just dollars, but it can be time, people, and of course, money as well. So when you add up all of the potential costs associated with these implementation tasks, the budget, is over $21 million. That's over the course of 10 years. But again, those aren't dollars that can also be the cost or the value of people's time. So it doesn't necessarily mean we need $21 million to implement this watershed management plan, but the value of the work involved in implementing the, the plan is equal to about $21 million. So we continue to pursue grants and work through the Urkel Whippet and continue our uh, work trying to target some of these key implementation steps. And uh, over the course of 10 years, hopefully we'll make um, a big dent in accomplishing some of these tasks. And lastly, uh, where we're at right now in the process. So uh, the watershed management plan um, will be submitted. There was just a recent staffing change with the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. Um, it has been submitted for review to them. It needs to be resubmitted one more time for their official stamp of approval. Um, they go through a process of reviewing it to make sure all the boxes are checked and we've met all of the requirements put forth from the EPA. Um, and we'll continue to solicit funding to work on implementing these steps and continue to review over time, the next 10 years, uh, what progress is being made toward um, meeting uh, the goals, objectives, 
and all the implementation steps within the watershed management plan. The plan itself will be um, uploaded to the Watershed Council's website. A lot of the stakeholders have had access to it, but we will make it readily available to others in its draft form um, within the next week. Uh, but anybody who uh, needs a copy before that, um, feel free to reach out to me. Again, thank you for uh, attending today and I can take questions. Thank you very much, Jen. Right now there are a few questions and there's more time for questions if folks wanna get something on. Um, the first question, I'm gonna do a little bit of um, guessing as to what this means. So if this is not the correct uh, question, Dean, please uh, correct us. But the question is the desirable uses for the Urkel Watershed Management Plan. I believe it's, um, are those des desirable uses um, do they come from lake associations and local units of government? So where are the desirable uses? Um, where does that list come from? Who puts that list together? That's a, that is a good question. And I think between the, um, um, the designated uses set forth from the state, as well as desirable uses that the advisory committee can develop. And they're usually pretty much on um, target. So it's kind of a combination of, of what the state requires and anything additional that the advisory committee wants to, you know, kind of add into the mix. I don't know if that answered it. Yeah, um, Dean, let us know if that answered it or not. Um, the next question is, do you have recent examples of citing specific steps in the plan to get grants and or permits or anything. Can you repeat that? Uh, do you have recent examples of so citing specific steps? So I'm assuming implementation tasks mm -hmm. um, in the plan to obtain grants or work on any projects in particular? Within the plan, and maybe Christine, you could address this through your green stormwater infrastructure work in Elk, in Elk Rapids. Um, I would say though, with thanks through the approval of the Grand Traverse Bay plan from 2005, we were able to secure funding through the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy to implement uh, a number of um, projects, including shoreline restoration projects and some of the work that Renetta uh, talked about earlier. So um, those are good examples. And we have other watersheds that we're working in as well that have um, a, a very strong connection between um, these approved plans and obtaining implementation dollars as well. Yeah, I think um, just to add on to that, because the Grand Traverse Bay Watershed Plan has been around for a while, a lot of the tasks and things that are in the Chain of Lakes plan we're already included in the Grand Traverse Bay Plan. So a lot of work that's happened so far in the Chain of Lakes uses that Grand Traverse Bay Plan. Now that there's a specific plan to the Chain of Lakes, as we go through the um, approval process and everything, that will be uh, a really good tool to um, sort of dial in a little bit on more specific projects. Um, so where the Grand Traverse Bay Plan had a little bit of a higher level um, in terms of what needed to be accomplished and how we want to protect water quality, the Chain of Lakes can get a little bit more specific. So as this plan gets approved and we start applying for um, funding, we'll be able to point directly to that plan and how the Chain of Lakes plan is part of that grand, the overall Grand Traverse Bay Watershed plan too. So it is a little bit confusing in terms of where stuff sits in which plans but know that the tasks in those plans have definitely been used by several organizations um, for writing and obtaining grants. Jen, you mentioned the green infrastructure work in Elk Rapids, and that's absolutely true and getting um, state and federal and local funding to support um, doing some rain gardens and firms and infiltration and things like that in Elk Rapids is the most recent example that we would have. So it is definitely- Can I just, yeah. can I just add? that um, local governments uh, have also used our watershed management plans to help get grants for projects that they're interested in. 
and that will be available to the local governments in the Elk River Chain of Lakes as well. Yes, and also added in here was how Three Lakes Association and Grass River Natural Grass River Natural Area cited steps in the plan when they did a recent application to um, the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. So, okay. Okay, let's see. Between the three of us, let's see if anybody can answer this question about the sources of sediment in the chain of lakes other than inadequate road stream crossings. I think the other um, major contributor is going to be shoreline and just general stream bank erosion. I know that there was a sediment study that was done for a specific area and there's, I think, smaller aspects that have been looked at um, too. So there is some information that yes, is yes. out there and available. I think either that's been done through lake associations or from organizations. So um, Christine, I think it's, yeah. I, I'm just curious if the uh, Chain of Lakes hydrology study will address sediment uh, at all because of you know sediment that builds up behind dams and so on. So that might be a question when we, you know, when we're in events that talk about that. Yep. I think, um, I'm not sure, I guess, that there's anything particularly unique to the chain of lakes in terms of where it gets its sediment, you know, stormwater, runoff, road stream crossing, shoreline erosion, those sorts of things. Um, there might be, it's a sediment driven system and there might be sediment that has been building up over the years for sure. And um, most of the Rivers and lakes are um, carriers of that sediment in one way or another. So, um, and I think there's some, there's a little bit of data out there. And I think, I'm not sure if the hydrology study will um, touch that or not, Granada. So that's a good question, something for us to follow up with folks. Um, the last question I have is, Jen, after submitting the watershed plan, when does it actually go into effect? No. <laughs> can be um, utilized at any point in time. So um, in the Department of Ener uh, Environment, Great Lakes and Energy already is you know, well aware of it. So it can be in effect at any point in time um, because it's already been under a very comprehensive review. So um, I don't want people to feel like it is not available for use at this point in time. Um, but once it gets its final step or stamp of approval, then, you know, when you apply for grants, you can basically, you know, say it was approved on such and such a date, but it's, it's still kind of in the approval process right now and can still be useful um, to whoever chooses to use it. Yeah, I'll, I think that extra layer of approval um, is really helpful and really great in certain circumstances, but the fact that the plan exists and went through the process that it went through, even in draft form, it's absolutely helpful and useful and people should be looking at it and using it uh, to leverage funding or resources or collaborative efforts for sure. So, and Jen, I think that there's a draft on your website right now. Um, it might be a previous draft. Um, so, uh, there are, I think you folks can at least access a draft of it until you get the more final yeah. draft posted too. So I, I need to make a few more formatting edits, but it is certainly, um, if, if it is, um, if I'm able to do that, I, it'll, you probably won't even notice that it's been slightly modified between what's there and what I need to do. <laughs> Unless you read the entire multi hundred page plan. <laughs> 286 pages, I think. Oh, you, you haven't counted. Of course you do. <laughs> All right. I don't see any more questions, Jen. So thank you so much. We appreciate it. Um, we're going to move on, I think, to the last couple sessions. So um, I'm going to try now to share my screen, see how this works. All right. So my question to people is,
Can you see my presentation or can you see my notes? I don't like dual monitors and I can't tell which one you're actually looking at. Right now we can see uh, the presenter style. So like the next slide that's coming is, is okay. Showing. Yeah. So let's try to switch that. Is that better? Yep. There okay. You go. Good. I want to give give away the secret to what's coming next. Okay. Um, again, Christine Christman, Watershed Center. Um, I want to talk a little bit about an action plan that several folks helped put together over the last um, about a year. Um, the idea for this action plan was to take the watershed plan and um, identify in there some of the high impact, high urgency issues that we had identified through that entire process that Jen had talked about um, and see if there are some things that we might be able to start working on um, in particular efforts that might need some sort of collaboration in order to get accomplished. So really either big picture ideas, uh, systems wide ideas, things like that, that um, we wouldn't be able to accomplish those things unless we sort of came together and started to collaborate. So the process I think is important to understand because um, there's a lot of um, high impact, high urgency issues that were identified. So um, the process that we went through was to ask stakeholders, we did sort of a wide survey of most of the folks that we know Lake associations, government officials, um, nonprofit organizations, everybody we, we could think of in, in the Chain of Lakes area and ask them to identify what they said were high impact or high urgency ideas. High impact ideas basically mean an action that is taken would have a significant outcome related to um, you know, that community, whatever we're looking at. So it would it would be a really impactful um, thing if we could get that that um, idea accomplished. High urgency means our community needs it now, either based on some sort of threat or an opportunity, and that really we don't want to be delaying any sorts of solutions. So those two things together, we asked folks to um, submit their ideas, see what they thought. It was a, a huge response of folks that looked at anything from um, water levels and flooding to septic systems, um, replacing septic systems, maintaining them, having uniform regulations across diff different jurisdictions. There's a lot of responses about stormwater runoff itself, what we might want to do for green infrastructure investments, rain gardens, buffers, things like that, um, creating or adapting stormwater management plans, looking at our road stream crossings and trying to improve some of those. Um, shoreline degradation was a big piece, having natural buffers, having waters as setbacks. Again, that uniform um, regulation across jurisdictions came up. We talked about nuisance algae. So how to identify it, what the impacts are, causes are, what studies are happening right now, and do we wanna continue those studies, um, You know, help us better understand the issue and what some solutions might be. We talked a lot about water quality and wetland protection. So having conservation easements to protect wetlands, having incentives for landowners to restore wetlands on their own property, prioritizing having easements and high impact areas, anything you could do for wetland protection. And then the last sort of major category we talked about really was just the ability to fund it. So can we identify specific projects that we have or organizations that might be able to be a fiduciary for other organizations to apply for projects, things like that. So we had a huge response of things that everybody thought was high urgency and high impact. And then we took those ideas and we said, okay, we recognize that these ideas are important. Now let's decide, do we have the resources to do this? Do we have organizations that are going to lead this? Um, are folks uh, interested in being informed as these things move along? Do people have funding that's either allocated or the ability to get funding? And we took each one of those ideas and we looked at them a little bit more closely. And we identified a couple ideas that we were able to prioritize by saying, there are the organizations willing to lead this. There's the resources available. There are the, the people who either have or want to apply for funding. Um, and we really find that this is a, a priority. We've acknowledged that 
All of these things demand leadership, resources, and expertise. And we identified projects that we thought um, we were ready for based on urgency and, and readiness. What projects can we do in the next few years? So the two um, areas that really rose to the top, we'll start with the first one, which is the septic system management. We had a lot of conversations around what does this mean? Um, what in sort of the septic system world should we be focusing on that we actually have the ability and the, the resources and expertise to really have an impact over the next short term? The goal for this priority is to ensure all septic systems function in a way that protects public health and water quality. And there were four tasks that were identified under this. The first two sort of work together, and that is um, educating and advocating both with local officials in terms of um, inspection ordinances, time of transfer, point of sale, things like that, and um, in policymakers at the statewide level for a statewide policy. And a lot of the discussions we've had recently are, should we be approaching local units of government to um, enact, say, a point of sale ordinance um, if we know that there's movement at the statewide level that would make that ordinance um, not, not be in effect anymore. And so making sure that we're marrying those two and that we really want to be working on the local level in ways that we can, um, but we also need to make sure that the statewide efforts that are happening are sort of happening in conjunction with some of the, the local, uh, local efforts that we're having. Um, so that's a little bit of, of a timing issue and a little bit of a tricky thing to sort of stay on top of, but um, those, those tasks are going to be moving forward when the timing is appropriate for those. But we really want to focus on sharing information with landowners. Um, so this is anything from your, um, you know, just understanding what the septic system does and how it functions and how it should be properly maintained from that to also um, talking to folks about if they um, want to be advocating either at that state or local level for something that might be an extra step, an extra layer. Um, and then there's a, a large effort for how we're measuring nutrients and monitoring water quality. And there are a lot of efforts that are happening um, to try to get a better understanding of how septic systems are impacting water quality. Um, a good example would be um, the Elk Skagamag Lakes Association did some sampling and recognized that a big um, clit off or a big weed patch off of um, a certain area on the north side of Elk Lake was um, because of the septic systems that were there. And so um, I make this sound like it was an easy process, but there's a lengthy process to sort of get them hooked up to Elk Rapids um, uh, municipal system. And so identifying those opportunities for when we might be able to measure um, either nutrients or monitor water quality, how we do that. There's several groups who are looking into using a, a QPCR, which is just a, a way of identifying um, what types of bacteria and things that you have. So the ability to keep an eye on and be able to monitor things as technology advances as we have resources and as we're able to better understand sort of that connection between land use and septic systems. Those are the tasks that were identified under septic system management. The other priority that we had was shoreline protection and the goal for this is to protect and restore natural shorelines. One of the tasks would be to strengthen, develop, and assist with enforcing setbacks and or vegetated buffers. So again, we mentioned there's 20 some odd townships and six municipalities and um, five counties throughout the chain of lakes. There are some, um, some of those jurisdictions have say buildings setbacks along the water. Some of them have ordinances for vegetated buffers. Um, they all look a little bit different. They're all um, enforced in different ways. Some aren't able to be enforced. Some of them don't even have triggers to how you would be able to enforce them in the first place. And so um, really looking at how can these organizations who want to further this task um, have a, a, a larger sort of watershed view of how these things can cross jurisdictions and make it easier for the landowners themselves to understand what's expected and to make sure that the ordinances and things that are put in place um, are, are really strength, are strengthened and, and are really gonna actually make a difference. And then we'll we'll go back to to the educating landowners, policymakers, and contractors um, about tools to do this. So 
making sure that homeowners know what sort of natural shoreland options that they might have, making sure that they are aware of contractors who can do natural shoreline practices, um, training contractors to be able to do those practices, um, ha having folks advocate for different policies at whatever level um, makes sense. So um, really having these tasks that are looking at um, that natural shoreline and how we can better protect that natural shoreline from development for erosion issues, um, runoff issues, all of those sorts of things. So what we're really asking from uh, local government folks is, you know, as we're moving forward with these efforts, we will definitely be engaging local officials. Um, and we want to know, you know, do these efforts excite you in any way? Are you interested sort of based on some of the work that that Grenetta did with the social indicator survey, um, are these things that you want to see? Are you interested in getting involved in either one of these efforts or both of these efforts? Um, do you think that they are worthwhile things for, um, let's say a township who is dealing with a multitude of priorities? Um, if this effort is going on right now, are there ways that you might want to get engaged with it? Um, all, all of those sorts of things. So one of the things I, I wanted to do because um, I wanna introduce um, Ron Pop, who is Whitewater Township Supervisor. He's been engaged in some of these discussions and has really helped us better understand um, the opportunities and the limitations of what local governments um, really see on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I wanted to invite him really quick to share a couple of words about um, his involvement and why he sees the, the work that's going on um, to be important. Well, good morning, everyone. And um, um, thank you, Christine. Uh, community members and honorable guests, um, thank you for the time out of your busy schedule to join this educational opportunity. On behalf of all of today's hosts and panelists um, and the folks that work in the background, we appreciate your attendance here today. Uh, following these three presentations, I, I do apologize. Um, um, I'm probably not going to maintain the level of interest that uh, these previous um, panelists have done. Thank you. But having said that, I, I am excited to be here today as an elected official. Um, obviously, um, you, there might be some others out there in uh, Zoom land, and you know that we have a plethora of, of issues to occupy our days. Some are more enjoyable than others. And my involvement in this specific process is to support effective communication between groups like this and the hard work that the tip of the mitt watershed has embarked upon and getting that shared with our local governments of the region. This drive kind of emanates from a realization that our lakes, streams, and forests play a significant role in calling this region home and a playground for yet many others. Simply put, these are beautiful attributes. These beautiful attributes are, are really assets. And like many of us in our personal lives, we um, uh, expend an enormous amount of energy protecting our assets. Why would lakes and streams and forests be any different? Of course, they are significantly different in the fact that we share the asset. And this sets up a unique circumstance between government regulation and personal property rights. This is a dialogue that many of us um, experience in local government almost on a daily basis. And few of us really want to engage it in a meaningful way because of the downside, quite honestly. But I think that uh, if we look at striking a balance between um, the, the data that these various surveys and studies represent, um, we can strike a balance that can be very effective for all of us. So whether you're change-oriented, supporting new environmental initiatives, or just kind of prefer the status quo, 
I hope you agree that by continuing our education and maintaining open conversation about these evolving elements of our world and more importantly, our local watershed is of great importance. I encourage others and yes, elected officials too, to join this conversation as soon as you can. Thank you for, for listening. Thanks very much, Ron. I really appreciate that. Um, this is a time for questions. If there's any questions about the action plan in particular or anything that Granetta or Jen or any of us discussed today, we have a few minutes left if there are folks who have any burning questions. Otherwise, to remind everybody that um, this webinar has been recorded and will be posted and shared with all of the attendees. Um, well, anybody who had signed up and everybody who attended as well. Um, I'm not seeing anything pop up. So I'm gonna say on behalf of um, the Watershed Center and Tip of the Mitt Watershed Council, thanks to everybody. Oh, wait, oh, <laughs> the question just said, good job. So thank you very much. We wanna thank you guys all for um, participating, for taking time out of your day to um, discuss some of these things that we think are really important. We're always looking for um, ideas and ways to engage with our local units of government and some of the hard work that you guys are doing. Um, we really want to be able to complement that. Our um, intent is to be a resource for you. So if there are ever ways for us to be able to do that in any way, please reach out to any one of us. Um, there's information about the Urkel Whippet Group on Tip of the Mitt Watershed Council's website as well. Um, so please reach out. Um, Oh, oh, I have one question. That was a really great ending. I was going to end it there, but there's one question. Um, and this question is for Ron. And um, I'll leave it to you, Ron, and your comfortableness of answering this. But the question is, do you have any thoughts regarding a uh, point of sale septic ordinance? Sure. <clears throat> we have neighbors uh, to the north of us uh, that have point of sale type inspections. And uh, what I've gleaned from some of their reports over the past five or six years is that we, we have, they have found um, less than 4% of the septic systems achieve a failing grade. So um, I think it goes back to the importance of understanding what nutrients are being found in the lakes. Obviously we might have specific hotspots like on the north tip of Elk Lake uh, that has spurred uh, investment into potential sewer system extensions. And so I think most importantly, we have to rely on the data and what it tells us about specific hotspots and to, to lay um, ordinance out in a general type platform, I don't think is appropriate at this point. Thanks, Ron. We appreciate your, um, your honesty and your insight. Okay, last chance. Any more questions from anybody? If not, we will continue to say thank you. <laughs> we'll remind everybody that this is gonna be posted and um, we really appreciate everybody engaging in meaningful ways. They're gonna help us protect our water quality and um, human health throughout our watershed. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your spring day and we hope we can engage with you guys again soon. Take Thanks care everybody. everybody. Thank you. Thank you.